Labor Day slot is the slot of choice uh, for me talking about prostate cancer with you guys, and it's a it's a real joy. Um, lots has changed since I talked last. I think this is the first post like pandemic talk that I've given. I feel like last time it was in person, so that must have been a few years ago now. Um, and there's lots to talk about. And if um, first of all, let me just say thanks for showing up. Like, what a great turnout! And I know tons of you guys, uh, which is awesome. And don't hesitate at any moment to put your hand up and um, and let me know that you have a question or you want to pause for a minute and kind of go over something. This talk is really conceptual. And I think for a lot of the, the people here that have already kind of been through the journey or are on the journey, it, it might be a little bit kind of basic, but I like concepts. And I like talking through my understanding of these concepts and sharing those concepts with everybody, regardless of how basic they are, just so that everybody kind of gets it. And if if you don't get it, you just stop and say, wait a sec, I don't understand what you're saying. Because I, I want to kind of walk through a lot of the kind of early stuff about prostate health, um, get into prostate cancer, and then some of the kind of new technology stuff that's going on and kind of all just riff about you know, some of the different options that people have um, uh, when the simple stuff doesn't work. Um, so yeah, without further ado, we'll go into Prostate Cancer 101. Although I think for most of you guys, we'll call it like, you know, 201 or 301 or something more than just 101 because you guys know a ton, I'm sure. Um, the first, uh, you know, kind of subject I want to get through is, you know, how do we stage prostate cancer? Um, I th you can make this topic super complicated or you can make it, um, you know, as absolutely, you know, ridiculously simple as you like. So I'm going to go through how I think of it when I assess somebody and, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we'll talk again about prostate MRI. I think this is a technology that has been around now for like almost 10 years. Victoria was an early adopter in this technology, but it's still worth talking about. And then we can get into like kind of the new therapies at the end of this talk. And um, I can sometimes answer questions regarding that uh, as well. Although at one point in time, I felt like I was maybe the authority in some of these technologies. Now I think a lot of the doctors in town are adopting these things and, and may even have more experience than me. So I'm not gonna claim to be the world expert in, in any of this stuff. Um, I'm just gonna try to share with you how I think about it. Um, the uh, Case like the case-based assessment here, I think, is the way to go because everybody here, if you've been associated with prostate cancer one way or, uh, or another, you've got a whole story. And if you go and see a doctor, they're going to basically put that story together for you when they talk to you and ask you questions. And it's going to read something like you know this what we're going to work through today. So just jumping right into it, there we're talking about a 65-year-old guy. Urinary symptoms are so common. Uh, amongst men, you know, once once you hit about the age of 55, things start to change. You know, quite often by age 65, things are quite annoying or bothersome, you know, and, and it just gets kind of more profound from there. And again, just talking about the conceptual reasons for that, I think the simplest way, and if you've ever been in my office asking questions about this, this is what you're going to hear. Your prostate is like a donut. Uh, it, Donuts are basically big on the outside and they've got a hole in the middle. And that's what your prostate does. You basically have to pee through the middle of a donut. And as that donut grows, they're going to grow differently. Some are going to grow outwards and they're going to preserve that middle part. Some are going to grow inwards and they're going to crowd that middle part. And so if you're urinating through the donut and the middle part is crowded, you're going to basically have a couple of different symptoms. We characterize those symptoms into two groups, obstruction and ir irritability or irritation. So obstruction, uh, obstructive symptoms are basically hesitant urination, slow stream, or just feeling like you can't control the pressure anymore. And then incomplete emptying things like you've got to kind of fight with it at the end to finish your stream, or you leave the toilet and don't feel empty and might have to go back soon. That's gonna be obstructive symptoms. That's because that prostate's collapsing inwards. Irritability symptoms are based on your bladder. And I always tell people that your bladder is basically a storage tank, but it's also a pump. 
And so that pump mechanism that pushes urine out of your bladder is a muscle. And just like any other muscle in your body, if it's being asked to do something that's excessive, it will accommodate and it will basically gain strength to try to do what you're asking it to do. So one of the symptoms people get with prostate obstruction isn't necessarily the hesitant type uh, urination issues. It's often the, the fact that when they're in the middle of washing the dishes or cooking for 40, uh, all of a sudden you got to go pee and you got to stop what you're doing to get to the bathroom. So that's the irritability factor. It's basically running to the bathroom, stopping what you're doing to go. And, and those are the two main characteristics of, of urinary obstructive symptoms. Now, there's other reasons that people get those symptoms. Um, having to run to the bathroom is often induced um, by caffeine. And I can tell you firsthand that the one untold story of the pandemic is the caffeine crisis <laughs> because people have been at home making a pot of coffee in the morning and drinking coffee all day. And I have to say, out of I see like almost 70 people in my office some days I'm seeing like 10 people that are coming in that have basically caffeine induced bladder problems so if anyone's dealing with that because after radiation for prostate cancer after surgery for prostate cancer overactivity of the bladder can still be an issue um, if you're struggling with that take a look at your diet and just see what the caffeine is some people tell me they don't believe that there's caffeine in tea and I can tell you that if if you're drinking, you know, things like red rose tea or, um, you know, green tea, black tea, Earl Grey tea, all these things are loaded with caffeine. And caffeine does two things to your urinary tract. It basically draws water out of your body because it's a diuretic, right? So you drink one cup of tea and you pee out two cups of urine. Um, and if you drink tea or coffee, like at night or bedtime, oh God, you're going to be dealing with it at night. Um, and the second thing caffeine does is a, it's a direct bladder irritant. So when you're peeing out caffeine and it gets in your bladder, it really just doesn't agree with your bladder. So this is a total side topic here, but urinary function is a huge part of prostate cancer treatments. And I think it's good to kind of start with the basics when we're talking about it. And we go to Mr. WCS, also known as worst case scenario. Um, he's getting up four times a night. And that's actually what gets everything rolling for this guy. He goes to his family doctor and his family doctor sends him for a PSA test. Just, you know, that's an arguable thing to do these days. But of course he does. And, um, you know, he diagnoses him basically with prostate enlargement and urinary symptoms that he's associating with the enlargement and starts on this drug to So... Many of you, I'm sure, have experienced drugs for urination. The most common one is Tamsulosin or Flomax. And what does that drug do? It basically relaxes the donut hole, kind of stretches it open to buy you a little bit more space so that when you pee, the aperture that you're peeing through is a bit larger. Um, but you can also take this other drug, Dutasteride, which is an interesting drug. It blocks the hormone that you're making. And why do you make this hormone? It's not because you're eating too many carrots. It's because of your genetics, basically. You can't really control your body's hormone production in this context, but it makes this hormone called dihydrotestosterone, which is a derivative of testosterone. Um, and we can block the conversion with this drug dutasteride. And by blocking that hormone, the signal for your prostate to get bigger, for that donut to grow, is basically blocked as well. And that causes the prostate to shrink, and subsequently the donut hole opens. So if you're going to take Flomax or Tamsulosin, it's basically like a reflex. Like when you when that drug hits your bloodstream, you're going to start seeing improvement in urination almost immediately. Uh, when you take Dutasteride, we're talking months and months and months for the shrinkage to occur to an acceptable level that you're actually going to see improvement in your urinary flow. Um, if anyone here has had androgen deprivation slash radiation, Dutasteride is probably not going to do a whole lot just because the glandular part of your prostate that we're blocking the growth of really doesn't have a whole lot of substance to it. So dutasteride doesn't tend to work if you've had radiation treatment in the past. And if you've had your prostate removed, of course, it's irrelevant. Um, so this guy goes on dutasteride for six months, we say. And uh, that's usually a long enough time to, to see improvement. You know, how do we gauge improvement? Well, a lot of for a lot of people, that's like, you know, they were getting up four times at night and they come back and they're saying, oh, I'm only getting up once or twice. And, you know, things are more manageable. Um, we can also look at the PSA numbers because if your prostate shrinks, your PSA is probably going to go down. 
And our expectations, if you're on this drug and you're taking it, you know, without forgetting to or whatever, is that you're probably going to see that PSA drop in half. And sometimes, and this happens in my office quite frequently, that we're kind of questioning, oh, is there maybe prostate cancer hiding here and we haven't figured it out yet? Well, you go on this drug dutasteride and then all of a sudden your PSA goes up. We say, how's that possible? Your, your prostate should be getting smaller, you know, but we're still seeing this PSA getting higher. Um, and that's a red flag for, for most people. Sometimes it's transient and you repeat it, you know, a month later and it's back down and it's, a, it's just a red herring. But um, if it is actually bona fide elevated after you started taking this drug, uh, we have to start thinking, okay, maybe there's prostate cancer hiding out in here, we gotta look harder. Um, so at this point in time, um, the family doctor picks up the fact this number should be lower, sends it to a urologist. The urologist does an exam and says, hey, your prostate feels kind of lumpy to me. You know, I don't feel anything here discreetly problematic, but it does feel a bit lumpy. And with your, your uh, PSA going up, you know, that, that does, seem pretty suspicious. So like I said, red flag, PSA has gone up, um, prostate exams borderline or non-specific, uh, that usually means we wanna do a prostate biopsy. Um, so in this example, we're gonna say that this guy went for a prostate biopsy and we did what we call a templated biopsy, which is we can't really feel a discrete lesion there and so we're gonna basically just look everywhere. And typically the standard is about 12 different locations. We divide it into six different um, sex tents, it's called, and we'll basically take two from each of the six locations. Um, now that doesn't work for everybody. And because of that, MRI has really kind of become playing a, a larger role in, in prostate cancer diagnosis. And here I'm gonna kind of cut to the chase with this. If you had a templated biopsy for this lesion that you can see here on the anterior prostate, so the rectum is down here, that's basically where we do the exam. And this person's lesion is on the front side of the prostate. So we're trying to feel where that cancer is, but we have to feel through basically a, like a squash ball to feel something on the other side of it. And you can understand how that would be actually quite challenging to interpret when we're just actually having a feel. Um, so, this patient ended up having a period of observation, getting an MRI, and they're saying this is PIRADS5. So again, what does that mean? So that everything that we do in medicine has to have some sort of scale associated with it where we can predict the certainty of what we're saying. So with MRI, there's what's called PIRADS1 and 2, which basically means it looks great. Don't worry about it. Um, there's PIRADS3, which means, well, oh, there might be something there, but it really just looks like a smudge. Um, PIRADS4 is, you know, getting to the point where it's, it's you know, closer to 50-50 or maybe favoring prostate cancer. Um, and that's, you know, called PIRADS4 because it has most of the components of what we expect to see with prostate cancer. There's a bunch of different phases we look at. Does it look light on this one or dark on this one? Um, and if you if you hit every single mark that makes us think it's prostate cancer, you get this PIRADS5. And PIRADS5 is like, it's kind of like prostate cancer until proven otherwise. So I say in my office, if you've been in there, I say, I'm gonna treat this like it's guilty until proven innocent. Um, so we take it really serious and we try to get tissue from that. So that's where we call in the, the radiologist to do what's called a fusion biopsy. And this is a really cool piece of technology um, where we actually will use a computer to line up the dark spot on the MRI in real time on an ultrasound. So if you guys can see my mouse here, this is an ultrasound. And that's just basically giving us the shadow of where the prostate is. Kind of looks like a chestnut or an acorn or something like that. Um, but if you look at the MRI, you can see this area all appears dark and it looks suspicious for prostate cancer. So if you just did an ultrasound for this person, you probably would just be doing a templated biopsy because you wouldn't see it. But when we do fusion, we actually use a computer to superimpose these images so we can see exactly where it is. Now, this one isn't a great example of something challenging because that's a pretty big area. But in some of them, like this one, um, that's a tough area to get to. And we don't want to do a biopsy and then find out that it's negative and then be like, did we miss it? 
Um, cause then, you know, biopsies, I'm sure many of you guys have been through biopsies. There are things that would be great to do once only in your whole life. So going back and doing it a second time is, is not anything anyone wants to do. I will make a comment about MRI, which is just that, um, sure. Many of you have been for MRIs as well. They do tend to have one issue associated with them, which is that they can be claustrophobic. Um, so when you go into this tube here that you can see it's quite narrow. Um, and for some people that can trigger claustrophobic events, I always encourage people to be upfront. If they've had issues with claustrophobia before, um, take some Ativan or some sort of sedative before you go in there, because uh, it's not uncommon that we have patients that go and try to do it and they just can't get through it. So no fault of their own. It's just something that if it, if it triggers that emotion in you, it can be very difficult. Um, thankfully, the new scanner and the new scanner that's at the Jubilee right now is bigger. Um, it's not really big, but it certainly is much bigger than the previous generations. So that issue seems to be less of an issue for us. Um, the scanner, the Jubilee also has a fantastic magnet. So we get really nice pictures from that. Um, so in this context, I'm happy to stop at any time. If everyone has questions, you can always just raise your hand and, and mention it. I'm happy to take a break anytime. Um, we're going to say this biopsy comes back as Gleason pattern seven. Now, Gleason grade is kind of a big concept. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it because it's somewhat complicated, but it's actually been standardized in the last couple of years to try to simplify it. And I find it's difficult to communicate to patients something that's been simplified when now instead of one system, there's actually two systems to try to understand. So I don't really know whether it's right to still talk about Gleason score or whether we should talk about the other category, which is called grade group. So grade group is one through five, um, grade one being the most benign, which is Gleason six, grade two is basically Gleason seven, and then grade three exists because Gleason seven can actually be consisted of four plus three or three plus four. And trying to explain that to people is challenging. It's just a lot of words and numbers and um, uh, the gist of it gets lost a lot. So I think when you say you're somewhere between category one or grade group one and grade group five, uh, it's a little bit more simplistic, but it does separate the Gleason sevens basically into grade group two, which is three plus four and grade group three, which is four plus three. Now, the concept I'm gonna talk a little bit about with Gleason score is that the number that comes first is the predominant pattern. So everything gets scored three, four or five and if you get a four or a five, those are typically more aggressive cancers. They're basically de-differentiated from normal prostate. Threes are just barely different than normal prostate. So if it's all three, you know, you, you got time on your on your side. There, there's no indication you really need to run in to do anything. Um, if you're three plus four, well, you're still mostly three. So there's some four there and a lot of people, and depending on your age and whether you have other medical issues that are maybe more relevant, can probably drag our feet or, or hold off on treatment. If you're four plus three, that means the majority of what they're seeing there is pattern four. Um, and because three is meaningless, if there's a lot of four there, that's very close to pattern eight because you know there's lots of four. So that's basically the take home message. And I think that's why they had to change the system just to kind of separate the three plus fours from the four plus threes because there is quite a lot of difference in outcomes um, uh, for treatment based on how much of that is there. Um, so if that makes sense for everybody, I'll kind of leave Gleason scoring and grade groups alone at that point in time, uh, but I'm happy to go back and talk about this at any time. Now, in this case, we're gonna say that this patient knew he had Gleason seven, um, and we're going to say it was three plus four. So he's in that grade group two, which is the more favorable Gleason seven group. Um, his PSA is looking like it's kind of stabilized. And just like in so many cases I see, life gets in the way. So this guy's a caregiver for his wife. He doesn't want to engage in some sort of treatment that's going to take away from that right now. And he decides to delay things. Very understandable. So we're, we're going to say we're doing active surveillance for this problem. Now, the one thing that... We would make this a little bit unusual. It's just that because he's taking dutasteride and his PSA seven and a half, we actually have to multiply that by two to get his true PSA. So his PSA is actually 15 if he wasn't taking dutasteride. And that's a little bit high for 
active surveillance. I probably would try to shy away from that. But again, this is a situational thing and it happens all the time where we say, well, we don't really know what that means. Having a high PSA like that, it could just be the way you're built or whatever. So we'll just kind of go with it. So active surveillance has changed quite a lot because we used to do biopsies all the time when you're on active surveillance. You would get a biopsy every one, maybe two years. Um, and thankfully with MRI technology, we've actually been able to kind of push that schedule outwards by doing MRIs in the meantime. So MRIs become almost like the speedometer for the car that we're driving. And that's the analogy I use for active surveillance. Um, it's like we're flying an airplane or we're driving a car and we have our dashboard with our instruments and it's helping us basically not crash the plane. So those instruments are basically gonna be your PSA, which tends to be quite versatile. Like, I mean, it will go up um, sometimes and, and be crying wolf when there's really not a problem. Um, so you have to be patient with PSA testing, but in general, if your PSA is constantly going up, that's gonna be a red flag that makes us wanna bail on the active surveillance. The other thing that we do in the dashboard is gonna be your prostate exam. So you come see me maybe you know twice a year, every nine months or something like that, and we'll do a prostate exam and just kind of make sure we're not feeling anything there that feels different. And then the MRIs will get sprinkled in every one to two years, depending on how high the risk is. Um, and you'll probably end up getting another biopsy at some point in time. And the role of the repeat biopsy is often to look at that grade group and just make sure that you're still in the same grade group that you were before. Because if you go back for another biopsy and all of a sudden we're seeing this, you know, Gleason eight or nine or something like that, again, we have to change gears and look at a different um, path forward because we don't want to let the grass grow under our feet. So after three months of observation, the PSA is up to 10.5. Now this is an issue. You're taking dutasteride, your PSA should be totally flatlined. You know, so if we see that sort of rise over time on dutasteride, that, that's an issue for sure. And we and this patient decides, well, I want to get an MRI and just see if anything's different. And we say, okay, well, you know, we'll try to get in, but the public system for MRIs is often two, three months down the road, right? So I just put this in here because not everybody knows, but there is an MRI machine in town uh, that you can actually access privately if you really needed to get it done quickly. Um, it's expensive, and I it, I have thirteen hundred dollars on here, but I, I heard recently that the prices are changing, so don't quote me on that. Uh, but it said Uptown, it is a three Tesla magnet, so it's similar to the magnet that we have here at the Jubilee. Um, they're in the same category, although the one that Jubilee is just maybe a little bit newer. Um, and um, quite often at Uptown, they'll do it within about two weeks of a request. So here's an MRI now, and we're looking at the prostate here. There's the bladder above it. And this prostate is now showing a dark spot that's really close to the edge of the prostate. So what does that mean? It looks like the tumor is actually starting to extend. So I like to talk about the stages of prostate cancer because I think this is something that is like, it's a little bit hard to digest when you're reading about it. There's so many different nuances between the stages. And what does it really mean at the end of the day? So I used to basically say, there's two stages of prostate cancer. You know, there's basically a stage where it's all in the prostate and there's a stage where it's in the prostate and it's somewhere else. And that really is the crux of the discussion because when the prostate cancer leaves the prostate, it really becomes a different disease. We can't just focus on the prostate anymore. We have to kind of focus on the whole body. Now I'm updating that right now because I think there is a third stage that's mixed in there. I think that there's a stage of prostate cancer where it spreads locally, maybe to a lymph node or something close to the prostate and the pelvis and it can still actually be stopped at that level if you can get it all. Um, it's not a common scenario, but we've seen it with some of the PSMA PET studies that have happened where we've actually identified regional lymph nodes that, have, that are positive and removed them and had long-standing cure from that. So that's not a common phenomenon, but I'm gonna say that there's definitely like an intermediary stage in there. Um, so, you know, what is staging? Well, it's basically trying to characterize exactly where the disease is um, and what is the severity of the disease, right? Um, so there's these different stages of prostate cancer that kind of separates it from a lot of other cancers. Um, you have local disease, you have locally advanced disease. That basically means that the tumor is starting to extend from the prostate locally. 
And then you have issues with distant spread. So the, pros the prostate cancer cells have escaped from the prostate and they basically found their way into the bloodstream, the lymphatic stream, and actually managed to implant somewhere. Now, the interesting thing for me from that perspective is like, how does that happen? Like people always ask me, like, if you do this biopsy in my prostate, are you gonna like nudge the cancer and it's gonna go into my bloodstream and end up somewhere else? And the answer with that is there's no evidence out there that prostate biopsy actually provokes prostate cancer um, uh, metastasis or evolution of the disease. I think that's an important thing for people to know because there's a lot of anxiety towards biopsy about disrupting cancer, uh, but that doesn't appear to be the case. The other thing I think that's interesting is that Gleason score is basically telling you how much the cancer looks like prostate. So prostate cells can only live in the prostate. But if they become de-differentiated, mean, meaning that when you look at it under the microscope, you can't even really tell it's from the prostate, it looks like it could be from anywhere, that's actually gonna be more associated with a cell that doesn't really care where it lives. It might be able to figure out a way to live in the bone or in the lymph nodes or something like that. And that happens through basically genetic deterioration of the cell as opposed to something actually causing it. Um, so the Gleason score really is telling you how likely is this cancer cell going to stay here, um, uh, which I, I think is kind of a different way to look at it, but also kind of interesting. Um, so so spread of prostate cancer is, is a complicated phenomenon. And when a lot of these modern approaches to looking at liquid biopsy, they call it, which is where they actually draw blood. And, and look at it under uh, what's called a flow cytometer where they, where they basically will be able to see all the cells going by. Um, they're actually seeing prostate cancer cells in your blood all the time. And your immune system uh, can deal with that and they just don't really have a place to find a home or have a mechanism to find a home at that stage. But prostate cancer probably at some stage will not require a biopsy of your prostate. It may actually just be require a blood test and we'll say, yep, we can see the cells in your blood circulating. Um, so not totally reassuring to hear, oh, there's cancer cells in my blood, but it's it happens and it's normal and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's gonna be metastases, um, which I think is interesting. And that's one of the new facets of, of cancer research that's, that's really opening doors. So here's a visual description of prostate cancer stages. This is where we can make it really complicated by saying, oh, there's tumor on one side or both sides or greater than 50% of one side or the other side. Um, I don't honestly pay much attention to this and I deal with prostate cancer all day, every day. So I kind of just say, well, if it looks like we can take it out, that's good. Um, and uh, you know, if it looks like it's spread to the rest of the body, we need to identify that and we need to treat it as such. Um, so the question that, that people always want to know, you know, will the treatment basically cure my disease. So if we're looking at the stages of the disease and we think that the cancer is localized, well, your options are basically gonna be surgery or radiation. There's some other experimental things that haven't really taken off. There's gonna be things like HIFU or, or focused ultrasound treatments to the prostate, cryotherapy, um, and there's all sorts of laser things that I hear about mostly from patients that are kind of doing their own research uh, but in general, you're looking at either radiation or, or prostatectomy for, for treatment for most of these cancers that require treatment. Observation, of course, is the other thing. We don't think you need treatment. Um, I have brachytherapy here. This isn't updated to reflect um, SABR, SABR, stereotactic um, ablative radiotherapy, uh, which is a kind of more refined way, I guess, to deliver um, uh, radiation therapy. It's external. So it doesn't require anything. Brachytherapy is seed implants. So they actually give you a general anesthetic and implant little radioactive seeds. Um, you know, so if you're gonna be on the docket for one of those types of treatments, how are we gonna know that it's gonna work? So that's where we bring in these staging tests, right? So that's gonna be your bone scan and your CT scan and prostate MRI is pretty much standard of care now for any new diagnosis, just to make sure that we know what we're looking at. Um, and then I, I refer to the gap. And the gap is something I remind people of, even though it's not the most, you know, kind of reassuring thing to hear, but PS, like CAT scans and bone scans, they have a, 
great ability to detect problems, but those problems have to be pretty developed. So I say you pretty much have to be able to see it with the naked eye for it to be picked up on, on a bone scan or a CT scan. Um, and by that, I mean like a sizable area. Um, MRIs are a little bit more sensitive um, size-wise because they're it's a it's a higher definition image. But in general, there's going to be people that have prostate cancer that has moved to the lymph nodes, but it's at a microscopic level, and we're not going to see it on these scans. So that's what I refer to as the gap, which is just that, yeah, we think your cancer is localized, um, um, but we have the limitation of these tests at the same time that may not really tell us everything. And quite often that's where the prostatectomy pathology report comes in. When you've had surgery, we basically send everything to the pathologist and they're going to basically tell us what the lymph nodes look like, you know, what the cancer looked like in the prostate, what stage on this, you know, scale do you, do you fit in? Um, so that can be helpful, but I always say that's always going to be the trailer for the movie. Um, the real end of the movie comes when you watch your PSA. So prostate cancer is labeled with PSA, whether it's in your prostate or it's in your lymph nodes or it's in your bone or your liver or wherever it wants to go, it's always going to be making PSA. And because of that, we have a huge advantage over the tumor is that we can't let it, it won't sneak up on us if we're doing PSA testing. If you have a prostate removed and there's cancer in your lymph nodes or cancer in your bone and we haven't picked it up, we will identify that because your PSA will tell us afterwards. Um, and that makes it kind of unique as a cancer too. I deal with a lot of kidney cancer and we're basically stuck just doing CAT scans every year after that, looking for something on the CAT scan, but we don't have anything nearly as sensitive as a PSA marker to test people to see whether there's problems um, afoot. So we don't really find out until there's something obvious. Um, so this patient, we're going to go back to Mr. WCS and I'm going to say here that his uh, local treatment has been done and his PSA is still going up. So what's going on? So um, his pathology was T3B, which means that there was seminal vesicle invasion, extra capsular extension, and there was a positive margin. Um, so that's an interesting clue because these things all kind of mean different things. And we could make this very complicated or very simple, but um, when you've had your prostate removed and your PSA starts to go up, it's coming from one of two places. Either it's coming from around where the prostate was, or it's coming from somewhere else in your body. Now, if you have a positive margin, what that means is that when they've taken your prostate out, they dip it in ink. And when they section it, they're going to basically look at what is touching the ink. And if they can see that there's a nodule of cancer, like the front part of the prostate that we we're talking about there, and it's all covered in ink, the pathologist is gonna say, hey, heads up here. We don't know what's on the other side of this ink. Like you might've cut right through the tumor and left tumor behind on the other side. Um, and if that's the case, we'll often see a pattern of PSA recurrence afterwards where it will slowly drift upwards. Now, in this case, this guy also had seminal vesicle invasion of the tumor, and that does increase the likelihood of lymph node involvement as well. So it might be a tough one to say, oh, if there's PSA problems here, is it the positive margin? Or is it the fact that there was a lot of disease here and, and it was likely into the seminal vesicles? So this is a typical pattern after surgery. So the first six weeks were undetectable, which is great. It's kind of like high fives all around. Three months were undetectable, six months were undetectable. And then all of a sudden at 12 months, we're detectable now. Okay, 0 0.05. Well, it's still really low. And there are people that make PSA in other parts of your body, like you can make PSA in your salivary glands. Um, sometimes the prostate's not entirely removed, like there can be glandular tissue that's stuck in the bladder neck that can make PSA. Um, but, you know, six months later, we're now seeing this PSA being significantly detectable. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2. I mean, we are two years out, but these are, these are significant numbers now. So we're calling that a PSA recurrence. And, you know, why does that happen? Well, like I said, it could be that positive margin or there's tumor that was living around the prostate that's deciding to make some noise and come back. Um, it could be a lymph node in the pelvis. So now we're talking about that gap of people that I was talking about that might have disease that's close to the prostate that we might still be able to, you know, get in front of before it causes bigger problems. 
And then there's basically people that have all of the above. So you're going to have a local recurrence, distant recurrence, and maybe some recurrence in the middle. Um, you know, so how do we investigate this now? A couple of different things, you know, MRI. So this is an MRI here that um, shows a growth basically in the bladder neck, which was adjacent to where the prostate was. That's suspicious for local recurrence there. This is a essentially a PET scan of that same area. Um, and we have the, the, the luck to have not one, but two different options for PSMA PET scanning here in Vancouver, where they can actually give you a dye that will light up basically where PSA is being produced in your body. And it can show you if it's a lymph node or, or if it's localized to your pelvis or, or elsewhere. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about P PSMA at the end of this, just so that we can cover any questions that people might have about it. Um, you know, so what becomes important if you have a PSA recurrence and uh, that's going to be the doubling time and what the absolute number is, right? So most people, if we think, oh, you had a positive margin, we think there might be something localized to the prostate, we're probably going to recommend that you have this radiation therapy done before your PSA gets up above 0.5. It's a pretty loose recommendation these days because a lot of the time, the timing of the imaging that is involved might actually lead to a delay where those numbers are a bit higher when you get to the actual treatment. Um, but that's, I would say the kind of standard is that if you have these numbers going up, 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 and we say, we're going to send you back and we're just going to radiate the area around the prostate and often the lymph nodes above that, um, then, then you're probably going to do that somewhere around a PSA of 0 0.5. Um, so when we're treating local recurrence, we're going to either suggest that we just continue to watch. And for a lot of people, this might be something that's occurred late in life and, and, you know, we're not going to worry too much about it because people are getting older and we don't necessarily have to intervene. Um, you could have the pelvic radiation therapy. And then for some other people, they'll go for the hormone therapy, which is just where you We'll take a short course of, of, of hormone therapy, which is drugs that drop your testosterone level. And you can do that for three to six months, get the PSA number down and then pause. And then we'll kind of just watch it drift back up over the course of often a year to two years. Sometimes it's shorter than that, but, but quite often you can get long intervals with it. Um, and then lastly, there's some talk about um, HIFU, which is again, focused ultrasound, which is a heat energy source. Um, chasing after the areas in the pelvis that doesn't involve all the radiation therapy. This is something that was looked at for quite a while, and I just I don't get the impression it's really taken off. So I think it's a little bit too complicated to do routinely for people. Um, so if you decide that radiation is not something you want to do, you know, um, after you've had a PSA recurrence following surgery, you know what's next? Well, we basically just sit back and watch. And I, I mentioned to people that I have one patient that kind of had surgery and I, I knew that there was like a really high risk of recurrence. There was a lot of prognostic things that were, were saying that there was going to be problems down the road. And he said, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm going to take off and basically disappeared for six months or sorry, six years, actually. And then eventually got re-referred back to the clinic with a PSA of 0.6. And this was six years later. And I said, like, wow, that's interesting. I mean, this person just went out, got on with their life and didn't think about it for a moment. And now they're back at a time where we probably can send them for imaging that will be useful and we can, you know, potentially get them on some treatment that they need. And they just skipped six years of like thinking about it because I, I think that in some regards, I'm pretty active in my clinic watching people and talking to them about it and stuff. And I feel like sometimes I create more anxiety than, than I need to. So I, I was impressed with this guy's attitude because he just was like, ah, I'll deal with it when I have to. Um, I'm not suggesting people go for six years without checking their PSA, but uh, in that case, it kind of, it was enlightening for me to see, you know, how much actual scrutiny we put on these numbers because watching numbers go up slowly for six years, it, it definitely has a toll on, on you emotionally when you're kind of having, every time you go, it's higher and you just kind of think, oh, what's going on? Um, the traditional rules, though, for intervening if you're not going to get radiation was that you let your PSA basically just go. And, and for a lot of people, that would be PSAs in the sort of 10 to 40 range. Some people say, and there's still argument about this, we had a big meeting uh, uh, not that long ago, um, 
where we said, well, is there a rule here where we have to start um, androgen deprivation or reigning in the PSA before there's any evidence of disease? So some people say, no, I'll just let it go until you go for a bone scan and you can see there's a problem there. Um, uh, personally, I interjected in that meeting, which was with most of the BC urologists and said, I don't think we want to let it go that long because sometimes when it, when you actually notice that there's problems, those problems can be kind of hard to undo, right? So um, if you have, you know, for instance, prostate cancer in your pelvis and it gets bigger, it might block your urination or it might block your kidney drainage. And although we rein it back in with the drugs, it might not work totally perfectly afterwards. So I have no concerns about starting treatment a little bit early when we see that pattern and we know it's going to be needed. Um, it, it sometimes, in my experience, at least makes sense to, to intervene um, when we're just kind of in agreement that, okay, yeah, this is a good time. But the numbers are typically less than 10 um, when we start, at least in my clinic. And that varies depending on who you talk to. Um, if you have evidence of bone mets, we got to start treatment because uh, you don't want to be walking around with cancer in your bones. It'll eventually weaken the bone and it'll lead to some sort of problem with, with your bone health or with a fracture. And fractures are no fun because if you get a fracture, it's a huge recovery from that. So, so um, you know, the one screening test that is really crucial is bone scans. If these numbers are high and we don't know whether we need to be doing something, get a bone scan, make sure your bones look good. If that's the case, we can definitely, you know, wait it out a bit longer. Um, so androgen deprivation therapy has basically a life expectancy. It doesn't work forever. It tends to lose effectiveness over time. And every cancer that I've seen has been different with this. So I've had patients that have been on androgen deprivation therapy or intermittent treatment for like 30 years. Like, I mean, it just, it's never not worked. Um, and I've had some patients where we've put them on treatment after say a prostatectomy and we've had to keep adding things because the PSA just wasn't listening. So you have both ends of the spectrums, indefinite success and immediate failure. Um, you know, if you average it out, most people say it's somewhere between two and five years that androgen deprivation therapy will work. Um, and thankfully, in this modern era, you know, in the last 10 years, we've had a huge amount of development in drugs that make things more effective than just dropping the testosterone levels. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that because some of this stuff is kind of old hat now, I'm sure for a lot of people, but we'll talk about some of these newer drugs and then we'll just talk about, you know, where things are going in the future. So Abiraterone, enzalutamide, radium-223. Abiraterone is pretty basic. So this drug is basically going to prevent the building blocks to make testosterone. Um, and, and that's pretty cool because when you look at um, refractory cells, cancer cells that are no longer looking for testosterone, how do they stimulate the androgen receptor to tell them to keep dividing and keep acting like a cancer? Well, it's because they actually figure out the recipe for testosterone themselves. So in these cells that are not designed to make testosterone, they're pulling DNA out of the nucleus and basically running experiments all the time until they find that recipe for testosterone. So how do we fight with that? Well, we basically take away the ingredients so that you know now all of a sudden they got the recipe, but they don't have the actual ingredients. And this is an incredible drug. It has to be given with prednisone, which is a bit of a downer because prednisone you know, has a, some issues associated with your blood sugar and um, sleep and, and uh, some other things. But um, aside from that, it, it's highly effective at, at reining in um, refractory test um, prostate cancer. And in the more modern studies, they've actually demonstrated now that if you take this drug earlier in the process, you'll probably do better because th this, this will actually prevent a lot of those cells from even figuring out, running that experiment and figuring out how to do it. So um, it's pretty cool on a number of levels, um, but not always the first line of treatment now because we have what's called um, uh, par PARBs or like androgen receptor blockers. So the receptor is the other target, right? So the testosterone has to get to the receptor. The receptor sends signals into the nucleus. So these drugs, enzalutamide is one of the first ones that was out. Um, other ones now are apalutamide and darolutamide all have different kind of pros and cons to them. Um, but the, these drugs really inhibit the ability for testosterone to bind the androgen receptor. And we've seen huge benefit from this for people that are struggling with um, hormone refractory 
prostate cancer. Um, and some of the new drugs like um, enzalutamide can have some issues with kind of cognitive effects. Um, apalutamide is like a once a day medication that's really well tolerated, although it can cause rash. And darolutamide is the newest drug in this class that is twice a day, which is a bit of a nuisance, but it seems to be incredibly well tolerated. Um, so really exciting stuff happening with drugs. And again, these drugs are now being brought into treatment at an earlier uh, time, not just when you had no other option. Now we're doing it when we think you are gonna need this eventually, but let's start it now and uh, we'll see a much better um, survival curve in the long term. Um, radium 223 is something that's used for uh, when you're in that stage of PSA going up despite treatment and having issues with the bone, it does do a good job at getting into the bone and binding uh, to areas that um, are affected by cancer and basically selectively radiating those areas. And what I don't have slides on today, but I thought I'd talk about is PSMA PET scans. Um, so I was talking earlier about trying to uh, identify exactly where the cancer is when you have a PSA recurrence. So PSMA is a ligand. It's basically something that binds to the surface of prostate cancer cells. And when that happens, you can tag things to it. So for a PET scan, they tag um, uh, fluoride or, or some sort of trace or uh, gadolinium, or not gadolinium, it's a, sorry, I'm gonna skip what it is, but it's radioactive and it, stick, it sticks onto the, the ligand that then sticks to the cell. So it circulates through your body and then it clumps together where, where the PSA is being produced. Um, the cool thing about that is when we put in this PET scanner, we can see lymph nodes that light up or we can see areas of the bone that light up. Um, and really the only way to prove that before was to do a biopsy, which can be pretty invasive, especially for the bone. Um, so now the kind of future of treatment is we're gonna do that same test, but instead of putting a tracer on there uh, that we can um, uh, do, sorry, gallium is what I was trying to think of. So instead of using gallium, which is just something that we can light up in the scanner, we're gonna put something in there that's toxic. So now it's gonna circulate through your blood and clump onto something there that shouldn't be there. And it's gonna sit there and radiate it just like radium-223, but this will go anywhere, not just the bone. Um, and it, it, this treatment has been out now for probably about five years. It's still not Health Canada approved as a kind of standard of care. It's probably not far away from that. I think the major issues are gonna be delivering that treatment just because it's pretty exotic and it requires like a lot of radioactive safety requirements and stuff that I don't think we're designed to do on a large scale. Um, but but lutetium uh, treatment and actinium, which is um, uh, like lutetium, but a little bit more toxic, um, are, are huge areas of development right now with prostate cancer. Um, not everybody does great with it. I think there's probably hundreds of different types of prostate cancer out there. And I think I'd say from my experience, about one out of four people tends to do well uh, with the treatment and three out of four may have some sort of modest improvement. So it's not a silver bullet. And I, I don't wanna kind of express that there's too much you know, opportunity for people with this, but there's definitely a subset of people that do very well with it. And I think the access for that's gonna be getting better in the coming years. There are places in the world you can go for that. And I know some people on this call have probably traveled the world uh, already um, uh, getting those treatments. Um, but they're st it, it, they haven't gone away. The pandemic kind of got in the way of medical tourism, but um, it's, it's really not that uh, far off, I think locally that we'll be accessing those treatments. Now they're not gonna be done for early stage cancers. I don't think for years. It's gonna be basically people that really don't have a lot of other choices for their treatment. So um, a lot of people ask me after prostatectomy, when you see that PSA start to creep up, can I go get you know, lutetium done? And, and some people have done that privately, but it doesn't appear to be a highly effective strategy um, uh, that, that I think makes it worthwhile for everybody to pursue. Um, uh, but we'll have to see in the future here, there might be some opportunity in the future to do, do something along those lines. Um, the big thing with, with PSMA and, and uh, lutetium is that the binding has to get more specific. So if they can get the binding so that it's just prostate uh, cancer cells, currently it will bind to your kidneys and a little bit to your salivary glands. Um, uh, if it can be just your, your prostate cancer, we can put something on there that's incredibly toxic 
like actinium is quite toxic, but there's all sorts of options for, for different tracers that we can use that will be more potent. And that could be a real game changer going forward. So pretty ex exciting times um, from the ligand group of people as well. Um, I think I'll just stop. I've said a million different things here and I'm assuming there's maybe a few questions out there that we want to cover.